Amen, amen, amen. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on, let me hear you. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, thank you guys so much. Let's give it up for these mighty men of God helping me this morning. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Thank you so much. Hey, we're starting a new series today called Relationship Goals. Go ahead and, and lift your hand up high if you've ever heard that term used before. Relationship goals. I know you have. Don't lie. I know you have. Second service, man, you guys are more tired than the first, but that's all right. That's all right. I got extra grace today. It's going to be great. So let me go ahead and explain this series that we're about to, to take off on right now. Relationship goals. The most important element of our lives is the relationships that we have and what we do to protect, care for, and value them. If you don't believe me, listen to this out of 1 Peter chapter 4. Say this with me, most important of all. Let's say it again, most important of all. Continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. And that sounds like it's pretty important. Maybe that it's most important of all. Go figure. There are people in our lives that rise above the regular, that deserve more than is demanded, and should always get our greatest. So we're starting this new series called Relationship Goals. And before we get further into it, I just want to let you know, my, my name is Pastor Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Would you give it up for yourselves one time? Because Lifeline is like my favorite church. I know we're not the only church. We may not even be the best church, but it's my favorite. It's my favorite. And you people are my favorite. So before we get, before we jump into this message, I wanted to show you a couple a couple things that the world thinks are relationship goals. So let's go ahead and put up this first one here, what the world thinks relationship goals are. This is a relationship goal. If you Google relationship goals, this is one of the first pictures you will see. And I just want to be vulnerable with you for a second. This is basically the relationship that Tiffany and I have. If lost, return to Tiffany. Because if it wasn't for Tiffany, I would just be lost. Oh, that's, I know, that's so sweet. But this is what the world thinks a relationship goal is. Let's, let's kick it up a notch, shall we? Let's kick it up a notch. What else does the world say a relationship goal is? Couples shot at fireflies they thought were aliens. Hashtag relationship goals. Really? Re really? That's your relationship goal right there. Yeah, I guess it's true what they say. Birds of a feather really do flock together. Yeah, well, I guess you better get hitched then. That's great. Let's, let's, let's see another one. One last one. Relationship goals. Wife steals cop car with husband cuffed in the back. Relationship goals. Because nothing says I love you like busting your husband out of prison. Can I get a good sardy holiday? Amen on that one. Amen. Yeah, relationship goals. No. Please don't, people. Please don't. Man, if you're getting arrested in the first place, that's not a goal. Yo, I've been there, done that, seen that. No, no, you don't want that. Let's, let's have some realistic goals going on here. Let's, let's talk about some good goals here. Today I want to talk about marriage, and we're going to talk about some other relationships as the series go, goes on. But I thought, you know, why not start with the most important one? Why not start with the most important one? Now, I don't, it doesn't bother me if you're married or thinking about getting married, um, dating or thinking about dating, engaged or thinking about being engaged, I'm telling you right now, this message is for you. This message is for you. In fact, if you're ever considering being in a significant relationship with someone, all of this stuff I'm about to run down to you is going to be very important. So go ahead and file it if it doesn't apply to you now. But I'm guessing that 95% of you, this applies to you right here and right now because you're either in or headed into one of the most important relationships on this earth that you could possibly be in. So I believe that marriage is one of the most beautiful, sacred, holy, <clears throat> difficult, challenging, stressful, <clears throat> lovely, satisfying, pleasurable relationships that we can be a part of. It has the best of everything that we could want and the worst of everything we can want. Don't believe me? Just try it. Don't believe me? Just be married for a little while. And the quieter you are today, the more I know I'm getting you. So, so bring it on. I know I got your number on this one. No, no relationship has more ups and downs 
than marriage. No other relationship on earth is also more like the relationship we have with our Father in heaven. In fact, you can go check this out on your own. Ephesians 5 talks about how husbands ought to love your wife as Christ loves the church and wives. You ought to respect your husband. And it goes on. There's all these roles and all this explanation. You can read that on your own time. Ephesians 5, it's got a whole series enough in that one chapter alone. But then he goes on to finish all of that to say, this is a great mystery, but it's actually I'm talking about how Christ and the church are related. So marriage is closely associated to our relationship. You are the church. Our relationship with our Heavenly Father is a lot like a marriage relationship. So with that in mind, we're going to move forward on this. Now, if you've got a bulletin today, I've got some blanks in there that you can fill in that will help you remember. I've also got everything on the YouVersion Bible app. So if you've got your phone out, um, you can just search for the YouVersion Bible app and look for Lifeline Church events. And you can, you can follow along with all of our notes that way. We try to make it as easy as possible to, to retain this content. So let's go ahead and get started as you're doing that. Here's point number one. These are all things that we need to be to have an awesome marriage. Number one, be willing to change. Be willing to change. Listen to this. James 1, verse 23 to 25. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. I thought that was, that was worth noting right there. Glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Basically, what James is saying there, the brother of Jesus is saying, you, you read your Bible and you see all the things that we're supposed to be going on, supposed to be doing, and then you just walk away and go, what was that? (laughs) And we forget. And it's like looking at ourselves, so when we see in the word the things in ourselves, so when we we find ourselves looking at the Bible and reading the Bible and, and seeing things in there, they're like, man, what is that? How come it says that? That's a window into your heart. That's a window into where we are struggling. Because God is true. God is truth. He created the universe, and he set everything up his way. And we just get to live in that reality. So when we hear something that is from him and we're like, well, I don't know, that's a window into your soul that you get to deal with. And marriage is the same way. Marriage is the same way. The best part and the worst part of marriage is the same thing. Isn't that crazy? In marriage, the best part and the worst part is the same thing. You want to know what that thing is? You get to see the things in yourself that don't belong there. Man, that's an awesome thing, but it's also a terrible thing because let me just be vulnerable with you for a second. There were ugly parts of my life I didn't even know existed until I was married for a year or two. Can I get an amen on that one? You don't have to say it because I know I'm getting you. After you're married for a year or two, you start to see, dang, I got issues. I got something going on in me. How come I'm so selfish? Now, this is me I'm talking about. How come I'm so selfish? How come I'm so self-centered? How come I can't just be nice when I know I should be nice? How come I can't do that? It's the best part and the worst part about marriage. It brings us face to face with the things in our lives that we know we need to change. Man, it's not just a year or two. Man, there are ugly parts of me I get to discover to this day because I'm in that marriage relationship. Seven years And just this last week, I get to look at myself and go, really? That's what I look like? That's what I'm doing? I can't even be nice when I know I need to be nice. I'm getting ready for a marriage sermon, and I can't even be nice. Really? What is up with that? And that is the worst part of marriage because it brings us face to face with our junk. And that's the best part about marriage because it's the best because we get to face that stuff and grow through it. So there are areas in your life that you'll never grow past until you, until you humble yourself in that relationship, that most vulnerable, that most humble relationship. That relationship, this marriage relationship has the potential 
to bring you to a place that's better than any place you've ever been in your whole life. Listen to this. I, I got an illustration about this. It's based off the scripture in Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? I'll tell you who knows how really bad it is. Your spouse knows how bad it is. You don't know. I don't know. But when I'm face to face with my wife and we're getting into an argument about some dumb thing, that lets me know how deceitful and wicked my heart really is in that relationship. Your spouse is the one who knows. You don't know. They know. You don't know the things that need to change. You're just you're just ho-humming along, man. Life is good. But when you finally get into that kind of relationship and you start walking in that relationship a couple of years, you find out there's some things I need to work on. There's some things I need to work on. Marriage is like a mirror that shows us all the parts in ourselves that need to change. So when I look at my wife and, and, and she's showing me things in my life that so when she gets mad at me about something, it's not her that's broken. I know that it's me. I need to turn because the mirror is facing me. When I look at the mirror and say, man, this mirror is, I'm going to get mad at the mirror. The mirror is just showing me the things that I need to deal with in my own life. Your spouse is that way. Your spouse is that way. Only a fool would get mad at the mirror for pointing out things about yourself that you don't like. Ooh, ooh, it's, it's like desperately quiet in here, like, maybe he's right. <laughs> maybe he's right. Maybe I am. So here's an application. What do we do about this? What can we do? What's a relationship goal? Here's a relationship goal for you. When my spouse gives me an opportunity, I put that in quotes man, on purpose, man, because this opportunity doesn't always feel like one. When my spouse gives me an opportunity for self-reflection and growth, I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to take it. I'm going to humble myself, and I'm going to take it. Now, that's a relationship goal that I would post right there. I'm not going to bite back when my spouse informs me of a way I could be better. I'm not going to get defensive when the person I've given my life to shows me something about me that shouldn't be there. I'm not going to get mad at them. That would be like getting mad at the mirror. Why would I get mad at the mirror when it's the person that's reflected in the mirror, me, that needs to change? I'm the one who needs to change. We are the ones that can change ourselves. We can never, ever change someone else. We can only change ourselves. And when we see something we don't like inside of a relationship that's most important to us, we can change ourselves. And that's the goal, is that we would do that ourselves. I'm going to be humble, take it, and grow through it. Point number two is this. Be content in Christ. Be content in Christ. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 5. It goes like this. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Listen, we all have hopes, dreams, and desires. We all do. I mean, you, you know that. I don't need to explain that to you. We talk about those things actually a lot in this church. I believe that. I believe that we all need to pursue those things. We need to have those things, those hopes, those dreams, you know, things that we want to do with our life to get fulfillment in life. The problem is sometimes we give those hopes, dreams, and desires to the wrong person. We end up giving them to our spouse instead of doing what the scripture said, is to give all your cares and worries to God for he cares for you. It's like this. I've, I've heard it described as, a hopes, dreams, and expectations box, okay? In marriage, when we enter into that relationship, we, we never enter into a marriage relationship or a significant relationship empty-handed. We always show up with hopes, dreams, and desires. Maybe, and they come from a lot of places. They come from the, the parents that we had, the, the house we grew up in. We see things that we want in our marriage relationship. We see things that we don't want. And we just go ahead and put them in the box. So some things that might end up in our hopes, dreams, desires box is, man, when, I know that she's just going to love to do all the cleaning. She's going to love to sweep everything up. And when I get home from work, it's going to be all clean. But she's saying, 
oh, you know, my dad always cleaned when I was growing up, and so I just can't wait for him to, to come home from work and clean up the house. We have hopes, dreams, and desires, and so we put that in our box. And then, you know, the big one is this, you know, oh, I just can't wait to get married because we're going to have one sweet little girl, and that's it. And he says, well, we're going to have at least two, and one of them is going to be a boy. Wait, that's not a boy, so we're just going to keep... We're just going to keep trying until maybe we have one, and we're just going to keep going until finally we just have like a basketball team, and we're just going to keep going. And somebody walks into a relationship saying, I just, we want a big family, lots of kids running around all over the place, and that's all we need. And then somebody else in that very same relationship is saying, oh, it's just going to be the two of us. We're all we need. And so we have these conflicting boxes here. Oh, here's some more um, hopes, dreams, and desires we'd have. How about the, the type of transportation? We're going to have in our family, he's like, oh, you know, she loves me, for, and she loves the fact that I love my toys, and I love to get around like this, and she's thinking, well, I know once we get married, he's going to trade this in for a more practical car, or maybe you're in a marriage like me, where she's like, I can't wait to fly a plane. Okay, so, all right, hope, dreams, and desires coming this way. How about the expectation of, or the hope, dream, and desire of how we're going to spend our time? Oh, once we get married... We don't need friends. We're all we need. We're going to spend all of our time with each other. And then someone else said, oh, no, we're going to, we're going to, spend, uh, we're going to spend time with friends. We got friends. And then when we come home at night, we spend time with each other. You see, we got hopes, dreams, and desires. We got hopes, dreams, and desires about who's going to do all the cooking. She says, oh, my dad always did the cooking, so I know he's just going to want to do the cooking. And he said, oh, I know she's going to have dinner ready when I get home. How come all my illustrations are my kids' toys, though? Said that says something about the hopes, dreams, and desires in, in our family. So we walk through life. We walk through life, and we just, who does the cooking, how many kids we're going to have, what kind of kids we're going to have, how we're going to raise them, how we're going to spend our time, how we're going to do the cleaning and the cooking, what we're going to drive to get around. And we take this box of hopes, dreams, and desires, and we hand it squarely to our spouse and say, here, meet all of these expectations. Here you go. It is now your responsibility to meet these expectations of, of, that I grew up with. Maybe I didn't even make them clear to you. But now that we're married, you're going you're gonna to make this happen, right? And we may not even say it. We just come home and the dinner's not ready and we're like, where's the food down there? I had a hope, dream, and desire about that. How come they're not meeting it? And the, the other person in the relationship is doing the same thing. They're handing us their hopes, dreams, and desires and saying, hey, how come you're not feeling this? But let me tell you something, a a box of your hopes, dreams, and desires doesn't feel like a box of hopes, dreams, and desires to them. It feels like a box of weighty expectations. That's all it is. You know what the problem is? We're giving our box to the wrong person. We're giving our box to the wrong person. Why are we giving it to them? When the word is trying to show us, cast all your cares Cast all your hopes, all your dreams, all your desires on me. I can handle that. God said, lean on me for what your hopes, dreams, and desires are, says says God. And you can focus on loving your spouse the best you can. Your hopes, dreams, and desires. And when we both do this, we are firing on all cylinders in our marriage. So what do we do? What do we do? What's the relationship goal? I will give my hopes, dreams, and desires to God, not my spouse. I'm not going to weigh them down with everything I was raised with, every expectation I I ever grew up thinking about. I'm not going to put all that on her. She, She couldn't meet him anyways because I got so many hopes, dreams, and desires, we all do, that no human being was ever designed to meet all of your hopes, dreams, and desires. It's not possible. It's faulty thinking from the beginning. I will not give my hopes, dreams, and desires to my spouse. I will give them to God. Because when I hand her that box, it feels like a cement block that weighs her down that she can't meet, even if she wanted to. Even if she wanted to meet it, she couldn't meet it all. There is way more than I could illustrate here. Way more. When I find myself, and listen to this, when I find myself Blaming my spouse for not meeting my hopes, dreams, and desire for meeting my needs. I will stop and remind myself that only God can meet my needs. Only God can meet my needs. And that's some people that we need to hear that, especially if we're about to enter in 
to a marriage or a significant relationship. We need to know beforehand that this, we all have this. We all live with a box like this. And we need to accept that and be prepared to give that to God, not our spouse, not that person. My need for affirmation, my need for love, my need for respect, my need for fulfillment in life, there's only one person who can meet that need for me, and it's not my spouse. It is my God who can meet that need for me. So let's move on. Point number three. Third thing to be, to have an awesome marriage, be the best. Be the best person for your spouse. Be the best. Listen to this, Hebrews 13, 4. Give honor to marriage. Remain faithful to one another in marriage. Now, faithfulness can obviously mean sex. It can obviously mean, you know, don't, don't go outside of your marriage relationship. But, but let me go a little bit deeper than that because I think those kinds of activities never start in the bedroom. They never do. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship we're talking about, whether it's inappropriate or whether it's the most godly relationship. No matter what relationship we're talking about, it always starts with words, gestures, emotions. Think about the inappropriate relationships. You know, what's up, girl? Kind of like sneaking in like that. I'm trying to win their heart with words, with emotions, with trying to, even if it goes quickly to the bedroom, it always starts with that. And even in the most godly relationships, it doesn't start in the bedroom. Obviously, it starts with I'm going to win their heart with, with words, with kindness, with gestures, with showing them that I'm, you know, maybe you're in church, you know, I'm a godly person, so I want to show that person in, in our relationship that was, that was part of winning the heart. I want to show her and I want to prove to myself that I'm, I'm, I'm going to put God first in my life because I knew she wouldn't want anything to do with me unless God was first in my life. Life. No, in every relationship, it doesn't start in the bedroom. So the faithfulness that the Bible is referring to here, I think we can go even further behind that and say, stay faithful with your words, gestures, and emotions. Huh. Track with me. So when a boy likes a girl and a girl likes a boy, it doesn't start in the bedroom. It starts with those emotions. Then the same is true. And so when you get married, a couple years go by. And you start to lose that fire. You start to lose that passion. And you start to lose the, the things that you used to do to win one another. It happens. It happens, okay? So I'm, I know it's like, man, I, I, you probably feel like that pressure right now. I do too because even getting ready for this message, I was like, oh, my gosh. We can all be a little better, so don't feel condemned. This is a message that I hope will bring forth. I want to be the best for my wife. I want to walk out of this place, and yeah, I want to do something good because I'm reminded that I want to be the best for my wife. I remember the things I used to do to get her or him. I remember the way I used to be and the things I needed to do to, to make that relationship happen. What happened to that? What happened to that person? So let's say I'm married for a few years and I get tired of putting in all that work and telling her that she's pretty and she's smart and doing the little things to, to let her know I love her. A couple years goes by and, and those things stop happening. Let's say the fire goes dim. It was blazing. We were doing good. And then it just slowly by slowly, it just gets smaller and smaller and there's just less passion. There's less energy. There's less there's less time spent. Well, what do you do with a fire that needs more fuel? You, you put fuel on it. You throw kindling on it. You put paper on it. You put fuel on it. And I intentionally didn't bring an illustration for this point because I want to have a church to come to next week. But I'm telling you right now, if the fire is going dim in that most important relationship in your life, there is something that you can do today to bring that back and to breathe breath life into that relationship you have everything that it took to start that relationship just bring it back be the best be the best because they deserve it they deserve it and here's the thing the chances are that we have just grown tired and we've grown accustomed and we've grown complacent in that marriage and it happens to all of us what I want to shake up today, what I want to bring forth today, what the Lord was really working on me about was, 
let's just remind ourselves. Let's give this relationship, let's give our spouse our best. Let's give them our best. Here's the takeaway. Here's the relationship goal. I will take responsibility. I will take responsibility for fueling the passion and fire in my marriage. I will do that. I will take responsibility. I won't complain that they're not doing it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Man, that fire is shared by us. It keeps us warm, and either one of us can fuel that fire. And so I'm speaking to both sides, but I'm speaking only to you. <laughs> you do it. You stoke the fire. You, you know, on a fire, you got to, and if you're like me, man, you get out the lighter fluid and just, because you're in a hurry, man. I want to get some, I want to get that fire going. When I'm trying to barbecue, man, everybody stand back. Stand back. All right, and that's something I just can't illustrate right here. No one will be kinder. No one will be more forgiving. No one will be more generous. No one will give her more affirmation. No, I'm going to be the best for my wife. I heard a good preacher uh, say it like this. Actually, uh, she said it like this. It was, a, it was a lady preacher. She said, no one's going to treat my husband better than me. No one will treat my husband better than me. I will give my husband my best. I will not let any... Because sometimes random people treat our spouses better than we do. Not even people trying to like pursue them. Just regular people are, they exchange kindness. You know, because we feel like we can get away with anything after we've been married for a little while. Have you ever caught yourself doing that? You ever caught yourself saying something that you would never say to anyone else? But because you've been married a while, you feel like you have permission to talk like that? So when this gal stood up and preached that and said that no one will treat my husband better than me. And that hit me right in the face because I knew right then and there that Joe anybody, at times, Joe anybody's treating my wife better than I am. That all I really need to do is just, just commit to my wife and say, you know what? No one's going to treat her better than me. No one's going to be kind her, kinder to her than me. And hey, listen, we all mess up. We all mess up sometimes, but that doesn't mean we can't double back and fix it and come back in and say, you know what? Apologize quickly. Turn that around quickly. Just, oh, I hate having to say this, just this week, I got so bent out of shape about the stupidest thing. And right in the heat of it, you know, that right in the middle of it, I had to put my face down like this and put my hand in here, and, and she was sitting over there, and I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was being so stupid just now. Didn't I? She's right back there. She's nodding her head. And I, and I just told her, I said, I just had a little out-of-body experience looking at myself being an idiot just now. I'm sorry. And I just had to do it. I had to do it. To this day, as a pastor, so it happens to all of us, and we all have what it takes to say, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, and no one's going to treat you better than me. No one's going to forgive faster than me. No one's going to ask for forgiveness faster than me. And nobody will be, will be able to say that they treat you better than I treat you. I will be the best for my spouse. I will be the best. You know, we all, we all mess up sometimes. We, we, all, we all have significant relationships in our lives, and we all make mistakes no, I'm not here to condemn you for that. I'm not here to just bring all those up to the surface so you can feel terrible about yourself. No, I want to I wanna bring those things to the surface so that we can face them. You know, when I was getting ready for this and I'm thinking about this message, I'm thinking about you. You know, I pray for you when I'm getting ready for this, this message. I'm praying for you, and, and God really wanted to say, he said to me first, and then I, I want to say to you that you have what it takes to make the difference in that relationship. You have what it takes. You can humble yourself, you can give your spouse the best of you. You just have to decide to do it. You can do this. This is the most crucial relationship. And as I said earlier, no other relationship in your life more closely correlates with the relationship that we have with our Father in heaven. Because we remember that as a husband loves his wife, as a wife respects and honors her husband, that's the way that Christ loves the church. That's the way that Christ loves the church. How did Christ love the church? He endured. He endured suffering. Even in the midst of us 
And I say us in a sense, the human beings. As we were nailing him on the cross, as we were cursing at him, as we were telling him he's nothing, he was hanging up on that cross saying, yeah, but maybe one day you're going to come to me and I'll give my life for that. I'll give my life for a maybe. I'll give my life if maybe you return the favor. You ever think about your relationships that way? I'll give the best of me even if you don't. That's where we both give 100% in the relationship and not just 50-50, not just meeting in the middle. No, I'm going to go all the way because that's what Christ did. Christ went all the way before we came anyway. And then we return and give all of ourselves. That's 100%, 100%. Listen to this. When we feel like giving up, we freely give love because love covers a multitude of sin. And that's what Jesus did for us. John 15, 12. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. You ever heard of the love languages? There's a book out, pretty popular. A lot of people have heard of it, the love languages. There's physical touch. There's words of affirmation. There's gift giving. I think I have all of those love languages. Mine, you, you just do all of that. That's good for me. Um, you know what Jesus Jesus's love language is? It's obedience. It's obedience. He said, you'll remember, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. Well, what are his commandments? This is my commandment, to love each other the same way I've loved you. So when we love the Lord, we are bound. We are saying, I'm committed to loving others. I'm committed to loving those closest to me. Because when I say I love the Lord, that is saying I will obey what he said. And what he said was to love one another the way that he loved us. With sacrifice, with forgiveness, with patience, with kindness. This is my prayer for all of us this morning. Is that we, our hearts will be softened. That we would come to a place in our lives where we're kind to our spouse. Kind to the people that we're, we're moving into that relationship with. No matter what, that we would bank these things. And we would have true godly relationship goals. That of sacrifice. That of patience. That of forgiveness. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Lord, I pray right now for every heart. Lord, that where, where the heart has become hard... Towards, towards these such important relationships in our lives. Lord, I pray for a softening of our hearts and a breaking down of the walls that's come up in between the most important people to us. Lord, I pray over every marriage represented here today in this place. Lord, I, I pray protection over every marriage. I pray blessing and multiplication in every marriage. I pray for reconciliation in every marriage. Lord, I pray, I pray that, we would, that we would lose ourselves, that we would get over ourselves, get over our selfishness, get over our pride, get over having to have our own way all the time like children. Lord, I, I pray that for me too, for every single person here. Lord, I, I pray that we would learn to love like you love with absolute sacrifice, with absolute forgiveness, with abandon. Lord, I pray over every heart today. And Lord, I also pray that I know that some of these relationships might have been compromised because our relationship with you has been compromised. Lord, I pray that, that we would be receptive to your love this morning, that there's a, there's a throne in each and every one of our hearts that is shaped like you. Only you can fill that hole. We've been trying to fill that hole with lots of other things. We've been trying to fill that hole with, with money. We've been trying to fill that hole with lust. We've been trying to fill that hole with work. We've been trying to fill that hole with our spouse, putting our spouse even ahead of our God. And even that will compromise the very thing we're trying to treasure. Because the order of the universe is this, Lord, you are first. You are preeminent. You are creator of all things. And when we decide not to put you first, that does not mess up the order of the universe. You are still first. We're only messing up ourselves. We're only messing up our own order of thinking. We're only shooting ourselves in the foot. So Lord, I pray for every single person here that we would see that, that the eyes of our heart would be open to see 
that there's a seat on our heart that only you can sit at. There's a throne in our heart that only you can sit at. And every single thing in our life flows from that. We'll never have all that you have in store for us until we put you first, until we make you king, until we call you Lord and say, God, you can have all of me. You can have all of me. If you would say that this morning, God, you can have all of me. Just go ahead and lift your hands up. God, you can have all of me. You can have all of me. Go ahead, say it in your heart. You can say it out loud. Doesn't God, you can have all of me. You can have all of me. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my spouse. I give you my family. I give you my work. I give you my money. I, you, it, you are king. You are Lord. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new, make me clean. I'm a new creation in you, oh God. I give everything to you. With hands held high and our heads down, eyes closed, I just pray over every single person that, that prayed that prayer, that, that that's the cry of our heart, to put you first. I pray over every person that we would that we would follow through and put fuel on that fire as well. The fire of our first love. And our first love is always you, God. Our first love is always you. So Lord, I pray forgiveness in the name of Jesus. I pray for transformation in the name of Jesus. I pray for breakthrough in the name of Jesus. I pray that strongholds will be broken in the name of Jesus. I pray for the breaking of addiction in the name of Jesus. I pray for transformed relationships in this place. That they would never go back to the way they were, but we would put our best foot forward here and now and give our spouse the love, respect, encouragement, and passion that they deserve from us. the Lord at the center of our relationship. In Jesus' name.